Can I try? I noticed that we've got some, um, some scouts sitting in the front row here. I haven't seen your hands up, so whilst we take it from you, give your hand up. Like, okay, I'll come to you in a moment or two. First, though, to, uh, to, to Paul, I think you guys put your hand up. You want to, do, uh, to come and claim the stage, of course. Hi, I've got a question for you now. It's about the international relations side of things, a bit, but what's moving really back to it is um, one of the big problems faced in the modern world is corporate tax evasion and corporate uh, avoidance, I should say. <laughs> Stay by the way. Um, do you, I've got a question to Daniel Russell and Rob. Is, the question is, do you think membership in the EU makes it easier or more difficult to ensure that big corporations, multinational corporations, pay their fair share of tax? Because we have the likes of uh, Apple and Amazon with uh, bases in, in Cambridge. So, uh, Daniel, first of all. Really good question, of course. If anyone really needs the answer to this, they're doing very, very well. But I actually think it's much more likely we're going to go to clamp down on these people um, if we're part of the European Union. I genuinely do. And I think it's one of the key questions of the age because um, we are seeing a transformation in our economy at the moment. I'm a pro-tech person in general, but I don't know whether any of you have mentioned Charles who got some magisterial work here to surveillance capitalism. I recommend it, but it just shows you how what started in many cases is quite an, an altruistic sort of utopian vision of some of these, these companies has been completely transformed by basically the, the profit motive. And they are now doing incredibly well. And of course, the impact has on our high streets, on our communities. We have got to really seize this. And the question is, are we going to do better working with our neighbours, a much more powerful group of people, or on our own? And I think the answer to that is yes. Okay, thank you, Dan. I'm going to go to Russell and I'm going to do a lot of Yes, I think that's, I think that's what I mean. If there's something in the answer, we can come by now. Um, from, from my perspective, being in the European Union or not being in the European Union won't solve this issue um, on its own. Because uh, we've been in the European for a long time, you're, you're in the European Union for a long time, and the issue's not being solved, I think, to anyone. So, so it's one of these issues that's only really emerged, I suppose, for five, five years. It's been a problem which has gradually, gradually come up, I think, four more. Four or five years of being in the European Union, these issues haven't been solved. Um, I think the Conservatives have started to make a dent into this area with the Google tanks. But the government itself is a bit wrong, there's not enough that's been done in this area. So uh, to go to the, the heart of the question, do I think the European Union will help us tackle this more easily? I'm not convinced, but it doesn't mean that we should work with our international allies to try and solve the problem. I'm sorry, I'm not aware that you have been, uh, been, been there, it's just the, the emergence in the, in the forefront role. Well, actually, the EU has been doing quite well in the previous part. Prior to the elections, there's some EU main major steps in terms of looking at how one will build a tax system to tax that, in effect, is oligopolistic global companies. And actually, interestingly, you know, if you look at the people who supported those measures, particularly MEPs from the UK, then the parties which did not support them were the Conservative MEPs and the Brexit MEPs in that previous parliament. So that tells you something. But I think that the illustration of this is that just in relation to the Conservative candidates' comments around Google, the contribution Google have made, I mean, it's tokenism, basically, in terms of the British government position. And actually, the, illustra the illustration of the point in relation to how important it is to be part of a very large block in relation to this issue is the President Trump's threat to the French in relation to digital taxes. Because actually, if we're on our own, the ability for us to defend against a President Trump style threat is, is very marginal. Whereas if we're part of the EU, we're able to act as, as a much larger block to prevent President Trump bullying. And that's in effect what he's trying to do, bullying the, uh, the French into a position where they're not being opposed to digital tax. And the interesting thing is that you know a number of parties have this idea of a digital tax in the UK, but I think I then will struggle to implement it unless we're a part of the EU. Yeah, thank you very much. Let's get a question down there. Which chicken scout troop are we before you ask uh, your sort of question? Uh, we are with the 27th. So my question is. 
couldn't make it this evening. <laughs> uh, my question is, with, the, with leaving Brexit and the opening up new trade routes to places like Australia and New Zealand, wouldn't that make climate change more of a bigger problem? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, one of the, the things that we have to do if we're reforming our, our agricultural and economic system is grow things closer to where they are consumed. Uh, and here in Zagreb, outside Cambridge, it's a very agricultural region, we grow a huge amount of food. Um, we actually need to change the system so it's grown close to where people actually eat it. Uh, and um, yes, uh, that's one of the problems about blindly increasing global trade, is that the emissions that go with it are, are precisely what is destroying the planet. Okay, and Russell as well on, on this. Um, if we just carry on as we're going, um, we don't try to change the way in which we live and the way in which we generate our energy sources, uh, our energy rather, then um, you know things will be, things will get more difficult. But the the thing that I'm pleased with the Conservative Manifesto is we've announced a launch of a £500 million blue planet fund, which looks at exporting UK marine science all around the world. Uh, in a bid to tackle climate change. Uh, on current estimates, around about a billion people around the world rely on fish as their main source of protein, and the biodiversity in uh, coastal regions is very, very important to keeping those people out of absolute poverty. So, linking back to my first question on global trade, I think if we do things to harm global trade, actually we inadvertently hurt the poorest people in the world. But I think if we do it in the right way, through things like Blue Planet Fund, and we couple that with the major investment in green um, technologies, I think actually we can not only maintain our standard of living globally, but we can actually improve it for the many and, and lift more people out of absolute poverty and ensure that we have a, a better planet uh, and a certain knowledge of age. Okay, let's give you a pack a few more questions in. The, uh, the gentleman in the right in the middle there with the green coloured jacket or shirt on. Actually, the green shirt can be green jacket. Hello, Henry Cameron, this is me, Henry from the Human Settlement Campaign. Cambridge has been very generous in welcoming mountains and island refugees uh, under the government resettlement scheme over the past four years. What commitment would your party make to further resettlement? Nationally and in English. Um, Daniel Tyler. Thank you not only for the question, but for the work that you do. Um, yeah. I know you share the enormous frustration that the council feels, as I felt, at the really um, terrible response, in my view, of the Conservative government in the last few years to these crises. I remember the, the kind of just the sense of hopelessness that fell around the House of Commons chamber when. And David Cameron announced that paltry number of people we were planning to help and we were planning to help and then it was failure to make it happen. So I don't think it's probably a surprise to you to hear it, but I think the Labour government will take a very, very different approach, a much more humanitarian, and not just in terms of, of, of asylum, and these are very different issues that it does in many people's minds like on the immigration system. We have a cruel system at the moment. I see no end of people coming into my surgery week in week out, families torn apart, a system that's hugely expensive for people, takes often years, and I think frankly it's designed to be cruel and heartless. I want a different kind of system, of course we want to manage an operation system. You can do it in a, in a genuine, kind, humanitarian way, not a cruel way that we see in this statement. As I mentioned earlier, I believe that we should be an open, tolerant, and outward looking country. And we have very specific proposals in relation to helping asylum seekers. We will reset 10,000 vulnerable refugees every year, and not only that, we will also resettle 
10,000 refugee children a year on, in, in our manifesto. And actually, we set out in our manifesto a much more humanitarian approach to dealing with asylum seekers. So we would close the majority of detention centres, we would introduce a new regime, we would move away from the department, uh, from the Home Office, the whole dealing with asylum seekers, into other departments of government. Because actually this brutal approach that the current Conservative government has taken is completely unacceptable. I mean, we are a country where our heritage is to welcome people from around the world. You know, the majority of us are all immigrants at some, at some stage in, in our history. And so therefore it is fundamental that we go back to being that open, tolerant and outward looking country. And Russell Powell. If you're fleeing persecution, and then you have what we're facing. The issue about uh, economic migration and refugees, I think, gets mixed up. But where, but where somebody is fleeing persecution, where somebody is in fear for their life, um, the Conservatives believe that we should offer those people uh, refugee status and so on. And there are a lot of things that the Conservatives are doing around trying to protect people, not just in terms of refugees, but actually promoting uh, LGBT rights abroad and ensuring that we, we've actually got a fund where we're trying to actively promote um, and protect people in various different parts of the world who suffer persecution because of either their um, religious beliefs or their sexual orientation or indeed their, their ethnicity. And so in terms of the community, and to, um, in terms of refugees, is helping those in need on I know Bob wants to come back, but I'll, I'll go with Peter first, and then I'll go to Jeremy. I, I haven't got a view or a solution, but what I do want to emphasise is that uh, currently I believe there are something like 75 million people worldwide who are displaced, and that that number is increasing rapidly and with climate change and various other aspects of the uh, planet is going to increase even more. And so when you look at this problem, you've really got to look at it in terms of its scale. Because 10,000 is not even a drop in the ocean. Uh, and I wish I could offer some solutions. Uh, all I can offer is mitigation to make it less painful. And I've got a few more to come back. I, I take issue with, with conservative candidates. I mean, just, just look, at, look at the position in relation to those young women who were basically groomed by ISIS and travelled to the Middle East and are now in detention camps. And the conservative government basically left them in, in, in no man's land in relation to international law. They refused to repatriate them. I, I, I'm sorry, but, but the way in which the, 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 it's been presented that the Conservative government has this human face is just not the case. And, and this is an illustration of that. This is an illustration of where actually, you know, those, those young women should be repatriated. I mean, they're, and their children. I mean, they, they, they were groomed, basically, at, at an age which was below when they were adult. And it's, it's ridiculous that they, they, they are left in this international no man's land. And, uh, go ahead. Uh, I, I uh, wanted to echo what Rod and Daniel have said about Cambridge being an instinctively welcoming and inclusive city, uh, and I suspect that we are going to have to fight to maintain that in the coming years. Um, and I would also echo uh, Rod's criticisms of the current government. Um, the, the particular green contribution to this debate is, as, as well as ending detention of refugees, uh, the, we would want to address the problem at source, which is uh, abolishing the hated and cruel Home Office and starting again with a new ministry. Jane, I know I haven't brought you in on this one, but I think you'd like to add, or shall I go straight to the next question? I mean, I totally agree that we should be very, very welcoming to refugees and people in real need um, and 
there were some other things I could have said, but I'm... Okay, so thank, you, thank, you, thank you very much. Right, and there is, oh my goodness, lots of hands going up. Um, I'm mean, pointed by um, gentlemen with the uh, with beard, I think, and the great, great driver. That's it. So, uh, thanks, Mr. Panel, for your perception of the seriousness of two geopolitical risks and your response to them over the next 10 to 25 years. I'm thinking of um, the sense that Russia is more assertive, that it's interfering in uh, the societies and democracies of countries outside its borders, that it's, a, that it's engaged in incursion across Eastern Europe into Crimea and perhaps other places. And I'm thinking of China, which has become less liberal, which now has a president for life, which is um, the expansionist, which will soon become the largest economy in the world and does not have the liberal values that have been described here. What is your perception of how we should be responding to those two countries? So the threat through both uh, China and, uh, and Russia in various forms, really, on both sides. I'll start, I'll start with Jane. Okay. okay, so it's a start with Russia. Don't get involved in my phone, but that's okay. it. Thank you. Okay, it's not with Russia. Um, it's even be surprised to hear you say that I think the biggest threat is a Jeremy Corbyn government. Because but the question is not about the no, 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 the government, the question was not about the government. Okay, no, 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 you make my point. Because uh, look at this, what happened when the Russians were in this country and uh, the state of poisoning. Um, and what was Jeremy Corbyn's response? It was, let's send the sample to Russia and get the Russian view. What did the government do? It ignored him, thank God. And um, the Russians were at fault. Also, Iran. He is a supporter of Iran on every single major international issue. He has always supported the enemies of the West. He's far closer to Russia than um, has ever been seen in our um, history. So as a country, what we do, whoever, whoever happens to be... So, uh, uh, so, uh, so what we need to do is we need to participate fully in NATO, in um, international organisations, with our European friends, um, and we need to be firmly and strongly uh, supportive of um, international resistance to uh, too much Russian power. And that's why I come back, because I think that this is uh, the most unusual election in my lifetime, which is why I'm standing, uh, because I think we have somebody standing who would jeopardise um, our country and the West. On China, I think it's far more difficult in a way, because China is such a huge power across the world in terms of trade now. China is investing deeply in um, Africa, especially. And um, because we impose so many conditions on investment in Africa, mainly environmental ones, who steps in and, and takes our place with the Chinese? Uh, we're busy uh, buying plastic straws, who's opening new coal power fire stations? It's the Chinese. So basically, um, on environmental issues, on international issues, we've got a real problem with the Chinese, and we're kind of pretending it's not there. And again, I think that the only way
has been read in terms of fighting and disputes. And actually, that, that piece is, is very important. It should be cherished. And the only basis on which we can make sure that we continue with that piece is if we're part of that block and we can defend democracies, we can defend freedom, um, freedom of rights on the basis of fighting those countries like Russia and China within the EU. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm supporting Johnson and Donald Trump. This system is working so well for this country, isn't it? And Jeremy Corbyn is going to challenge it, to change it. And there are people going to try and stand in his way, and that's what we're hearing here. What he says, always, is find the truth before jumping to the conclusion. Don't always rush to the obvious conclusion. And why hasn't Boris Johnson published that report on Russian interference? What's he got to hide? Friends, this is a real chance to change the narrative of this country. The people whose interests lies in no change. We will change. Yeah, one more question. Okay, here we go. Um, I've got lots of people 
frantic, but the gentleman there, like, waving at me, he was over there, like, I've got a lost friend, but that day he was, uh, but go ahead. It's all right, it's all right. We met a long time ago. Okay. You probably don't remember it. Um, yeah, I'd just like to question, ask a question about, um, in the order then, there might be a minority government. Who would all you characters be supporting? Because I'm a little bit worried about some of you. I kind of like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even let Joe go through the debate. I'm not going to make it. I'll just go down the line and ask everybody. Um, uh, Jeremy, who, who are your coalition partners? Uh, anybody in the Tories. So our position was very clear that 80% of our target seats are in Tory-facing constituencies. In order to block a Conservative government, it's only the Liberal Democrats that will achieve that in this election. And not only that, we will hold the feet of Labour in terms of holding a second referendum. And actually, it's the United, it's the United to Remain block in Parliament that is critical. Because in a home Parliament, that will deliver Remain legislation. And we don't, we don't want to put anybody into a coalition government at all. What we want to deliver is a people's vote with Remain on the ballot paper and either a Theresa May or a Boris Johnson option for leave. So it's just a point uh, after my first week, so you're saying no coalition with anybody, no return to Conservatives or further back, we live out the fact it's just going to be working with that Remain block. This election is about Brexit. We're very clear that we want a second referendum in order to fight for Remain. Thank you. Uh, uh, I want to form a coalition with Extension Rebellion and hopefully to get them working with us to save the planet. No, I was prepared for the Conservatives. Um, when you don't get that open for a job, it should that happen. What would you be your uh, prime partner? I'm a pragmatist and I do what's in front of me at the moment. And we're in it for the uh, What happens after this is a minority government? I, I, I couldn't well, even there's 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 there's
that we win that referendum, and this time we really will be together because the 16 year olds will have the vote, because the EU nationals will have the vote, and that will keep us in the European Union. The institution has done so much to secure peace and security. I'm your Romania, stick with me. Thank you. 